He acquired this incredible team. The investors didn't get all their money back and avoid antitrust scrutiny. This is a jujitsu move that I haven't seen before. It's definitely a jujitsu move. And I still don't quite understand how he got away with it because Emil, you're right. Investors are being made whole. I believe that was the actual phrase in the announcement, which probably means I'll get their money back. But if I'm an investor and I'm in a hot AI company and they're like, good news, we're taking all the talent out and you get your money back. You get a 1x. I'm not happy. You're listening to the Startup Podcast. This is a Reacts episode. Industry insiders having frank debates about the latest tech, politics, and business news. Whether you're a founder, investor, or operator in a startup, you'll gain insights into how current events connect to broader themes and trends that impact your startup, your investments, and your day-to-day operational decisions. The conversation starts now. Hey, I'm Chris Saad. Hi, I'm Kimberly Marshall. Hi, I'm Emil Michael. And I'm Yaniv Bernstein. Kimberly, it's your first time joining us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, I am Kimberly Marshall. I am an investor and advisor in early stage companies and venture capital funds. I've been doing that for a number of years now and helped build a couple of different things. I helped build Uber. I built the EdTech investing strategy at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I built the Black and Latinx investing strategy for Goldman Sachs, not to GS. And really enjoy increasing access for diverse founders and diverse VCs. Awesome. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome to this week's The Startup Podcast Reacts. On today's show, we're going to discuss the Reddit IPO, the value skyrocketing. We're going to tell you what it means. Microsoft acquires Inflection AI and is building its new AI department. We'll tell you more about that and its implications for OpenAI and the future of Microsoft's efforts there. And we'll recap some of Sequoia's AI conference, some of the ideas and thoughts that came out of that. And some of that will actually impact the way founders should think about their own AI startups and the way investors think about their startups. And finally, we'll touch a little bit on AI PCs from Microsoft and Apple. What is this nonsense branding and what will real AI hardware look like in the future? All that and more on this week's episode. Stay tuned. This episode of the Startup Podcast is brought to you by Vanta. You might know that sinking feeling. You're about to land a big contract when they ask about compliance. SOC 2, ISO, PCI, Essential 8. You've just snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. Not anymore. Vanta massively accelerates your compliance efforts and allows you to get those life-changing deals back on track. Don't wait until it's panic stations, though. Get started with Vanta today. They're offering 20% off their prices just for TSP listeners. Do yourself a favor. Hit pause. Go to vanta.com slash TSP. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com to get that 20% off. All right. Our first topic today is the Reddit IPO. Sam Altman owns a huge chunk of the stock. The value has been skyrocketing post IPO. And what does this all mean? Is the market back? Our IPO is back on the table. We're going to get a huge amounts of venture capital and FOMO bubbles again. What's going on, Emil? You're the deal maker on the pod. What's your read of what's going on? Well, the market is back, like broadly speaking, S&P 500, NVIDIA to the moon, right? So like people are making dough. So the fact that this is one of the first tech IPOs maybe since Instacart, I don't know, that was like a while ago. And that was Mm. maybe an IPO that had to go. It wasn't sort of timed may open the window again for Databricks, Revolut, Canva, some of these other great tech companies that have been in the hopper. And the fact that it's traded up is a good sign. That means that, you know, maybe institutions are buying the stock and holding it and so on. So I hope this reopens the liquidity window, which has been closed since early 22. You know, what I liked about it, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first social media platform IPO since 2019. And I think what's very telling and interesting about it is a lot of Reddit's turnaround story is related to its content moderation. And I think that really shows kind of the value that users, advertisers, that platforms prescribe to there being a you know welcoming and safe space for people to exchange ideas. Yeah, actually, I think that's a really interesting point. Just for those who haven't followed over the past few years, Reddit used to be considered a bit of a sewer, right? There was a lot of very, very toxic stuff there. It was considered often second only to 4chan in terms of the amount of toxicity on the platform. And then there was a move by the leadership of that company to 
crackdown on the most extreme speech on the toxicity with a sort of quite aggressive moderation program. And at one point, I think there was a user revolt and there was a question of, is Reddit killing the goose that lays the golden egg? But actually what it ended up doing is creating a much more welcoming environment that attracted more people. So yes, I think it's definitely a big win for content moderation. There's another thing I wanted to discuss about this one, which is how to interpret this IPO beyond, Emil, as you say, like the markets are back. Because one way of viewing Reddit is as a fairly crappy business. It is an advertising business that is what some people would call subscale, right? It is producing less than a billion dollars in revenue a year. It is way, 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 way smaller than Facebook, than Google. It's even smaller than Snapchat, which has been struggling on the public markets. And I believe the company has never turned a profit. So you could say, well, this is pretty rich. And this is an argument for, well, investors are risk on again, and they're happy to take a bet on something like this. But one other interpretation that I'd be interested in people's thoughts on is, is this an AI IPO? Because one of the narratives that you hear is, well, the real value of Reddit is going to be this huge amount of content that they're able to license to the big AI players. And they've already started doing that. So how do we interpret the pop? I do think a lot of the pop is related to exactly that. Reddit is claiming you know, some of the value of its content for training large language models like ChatGPT has definitely been what's driving a lot of this search. That's interesting, actually, because I, I had not been following it closely and I had not perceived it as an AI play. My interest in it was, Emil, what you were saying, which is like the market is back and that this was a signal in a way that like the rest of the market bull run has been AI powered. And this felt not AI powered. It felt like it's worse than AI powered. It's social media, right? But yeah, now that you're connecting it to the AI story, you can speak with a little bit less confidence that like, hey, the broader market is back and it's like risk on for everything and tech stocks are all good. There's an AI angle list that I hadn't actually immediately considered. I think the question is, is the AI angle, it's an angle, but is that actually what's driving investor action? I don't know. I mean, one-time payments yeah. or you can't put them at discounted cash flow analysis that predictably and add a lot of market cap. Here's my like wild theory on why it's also interesting. It's like Wall Street bets came out of Reddit. <laughs> all kinds of like new weird stuff comes out of that. And I don't know exactly how to monetize that, but like, man, it was a phenomenon. I don't know if you guys saw the movie on Netflix. It was super interesting and fun. I did. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe it is irrational exuberance, but it's worth 10 billion. You want to compare it to Facebook? That's not a legit comparison, right? Compare it to Twitter. I was about to say, yes. Or X. We're calling it Twitter on this show, Emil. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that was doing like four or five billion when Elon bought it for 44 billion. So the numbers yeah. about match that peak. Twitter's peak, you know, X's peak. Well, exactly. And I think you're absolutely right. Twitter is the correct comparison. Before Elon swooped in, Twitter was known as a perennial underperformer on the stock market. It used to be a public company, right? And the problem that people said with it is it is this hugely influential media property that has not been able to adequately capture the value of its cultural influence. And that is something that you could pretty much copy paste and say the same about Reddit. Twitter never figured it out. They still haven't figured it out. So what makes us think, what makes anybody think that Reddit will figure it out? Who's bought stock? Who's buying the stock? That's the question. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not buying it, but I mean, I, I continue to believe that Twitter is the product that Twitter, the company could not kill despite their best efforts. And so, yeah, Twitter failed to monetize their cultural significance and their incredible just-in-time, real-time community. But I don't think that says much about the value of a real-time social nervous system or of the value of a Reddit that creates memes and social movements. I just think that the Twitter company lacked imagination and competence to turn that into something interesting. So I do think that Reddit has been operated methodically and pragmatically for a long time. In fact, a lot of people may not remember, and there was a moment there where Dig was the darling. D-I-G-G -G was like this huge community where you'd- Showing your age, Chris. I know, I know. Where you'd share links and you'd discuss it. It was very Reddit-like. And Reddit was actually not that cool. And the CEO and founder of Dig was on the front page of whatever and was the $60 million kid. And then they stumbled and Reddit was able to blow by them and build something that Dig did not ultimately. And so it's been methodical, inexorable, pragmatic. They clean the community up. There's competence there, which Twitter, the company, has not exhibited and is even worse with all the thrash with Elon. 
And yet they've still never turned a profit. They've still never broken a billion in revenue. This company is 17 years old. This is not an overnight success story, right? You talk about competing with Dig and if you're even older, you'll remember Slashdot, which came before Dig, right? I'm still sentimental about Slashdot. I think beyond Reddit itself, I think the really interesting thing too is their last valuation in 2021 was at 10 billion. And they priced at a six and a half billion dollar valuation. Obviously it's traded up since then, but as other tech companies are looking at going public, it will be interesting to see how that shakes out. And Emil, I imagine you probably have some views on that as well. Will people be able to price at or be up at or above their last private market valuation? That's a very good point. Like I think Instacart's last private mark was 45 billion and went public at eight. So you're right, like it's showing sort of anything that priced in that 19, 20, 21 period that goes public is going to have a tough time hitting that mark. So let's move on to our second topic. Kimberly, cue it up. Sure, absolutely. So Microsoft did a sort of aqua hire of Inflection AI. $650 million deal. $620 million of it is for a non-exclusive licensing of Inflection's product. The other $30 million is going towards salaries and that sort of thing. And as part of the deal, Microsoft effectively almost gutted all of Inflection AI, bringing over 70 of Inflection's staff to Microsoft, which will be led by Suleiman, who is also leading up a larger part of the AI team over at Microsoft. So what do we call this? It's not an acquisition. It's not an aqua hire. What is this deal? I mean, I love Satya. This guy is Satya at Microsoft. Like, damn. Damn. He, he, is, man, <laughs> he is making moves. Not only does this avoid antitrust scrutiny, because it's not an acquisition, as Kimberly pointed out, it sort of returns some or most of the capital, is my understanding, to existing investors. And he has a whole new team that's some of the best in the world that has an earnout based on how they perform. So he acquired this incredible team. The investors didn't get all their money back and avoided antitrust scrutiny. This is a jujitsu move that I haven't seen before. Well, it sounds like not only did he get the team, he got them in a way where they have a performance goal, rather. They've actually got to perform and deliver as well. So he's got them with you know high degrees of hustle and paranoia. And yeah, it's almost more important because yeah. you don't want them to land and just sit on their laurels. It's definitely a jujitsu move. And I still don't quite understand how he got away with it because Emil, you're right. Investors are being made whole. I believe that was the actual phrase in the announcement, which probably means I'll get their money back. But if I'm an investor and I'm in a hot AI company, and they're like, good news, we're taking all the talent out and you get your money back. You get a 1x. I'm not happy. And by the way, you know, one of the big backers of Inflection is Reid Hoffman, right? So these are heavy hitters. And, and by the way, for folks who, who are not like deep in the AI inside baseball, like Mustafa Suleiman is one of the absolute stars. He's like up there with Sam Altman and Ilya and all those guys. And so it nearly feels like Microsoft arguably already has OpenAI and Sam Altman in their pocket. And again, in a very clever way that avoids any antitrust scrutiny. And now they've got, you could call them the number two or whatever, just another absolute star is now working for them. And so, like you said, Emil, like Satya, damn, he's really playing this game very well. And the concentration of AI talent that is now, I guess you would say working for or answerable to Microsoft is pretty epic. I would say it's interesting as well. You mentioned Reid Hoffman is one of the main investors. Obviously, he's also on the Microsoft board and Bill Gates was a big investor as well. Mm. So this is a lovely outcome for those major investors that are also tied to Microsoft. And it's arguable while inflection was building great things. Like you could say that a lot of the main tech companies have already aligned with other AI companies. And so this was a pretty good exit that they may not have achieved or may not have materialized without this Apple hired by Microsoft. Yeah, I would add to that, that let's say you're not Reed Hoffman, you're not on the board of Microsoft and inflection, and you're an investor and you're like, shit, I only got my money back. You might be okay with that if you thought like, because what I read was that Inflection didn't feel that it had enough concentration of talent and enough money and enough new angles to make use of the billion or so that they raised. So because we know compute's so expensive, if the alternative was like, screw it, let's give it a go and burn 700 million of that billion dollars and see what happens, maybe they're okay with getting their money back. Mm -hmm. And that might've been the rational outcome for investors. 
So I have a question. I don't know if anyone knows the actual mechanism through which these investors are being made whole. Because as we said, there is no acquisition. So in fact, inflection is not being shut down. It will remain a going concern, just a shadow of its former self. So is Microsoft paying these investors some sort of fee? How is that actually structured? Yeah, I don't know how it's structured. The data set I saw said the investors of the last round will get 1.1x and the investors of the round prior to that would be receiving 1.3x back. But I don't know the actual mm. structure of that. Mm. And then there's some expectation that they will continue to reap returns from the licensing, not just through Microsoft, but the other licensing deals that Inflection may be able to do as well. There's a thousand ways to structure this. You have like money on the balance sheet. They could just say, we're returning that money. They do a buyback, mm. put the money in the balance sheet and then buy back. Mm. The structure is less interesting at that level than it is at, holy cow, is this a new way to acquire companies? <laughs> if you're a big tech giant. I think that what's interesting about it is it's a new way of acquiring companies, at least in AI, because what you're actually acquiring is not a product, not even IP. You are acquiring like what's in people's brains. You're acquiring talent. And I feel like I haven't seen this since the early days of Google, except this is even more on steroids, where Google was like, we're just going to pile up all the brains that we can get and somehow something good will come of it, right? And now in the AI world, especially, I think it's much more kind of star driven. Like there are a few dozen superstars and a few hundred stars in the AI world who are at the cutting edge. And whoever owns those brains kind of owns the future. And Satya seems to be playing this next level game of just piling up those brains. One of the pieces I was surprised about is that Mustafa is not just joining Microsoft, but he's now taking over the vast majority of a, a lot of their AI pieces. Now all of the teams that did Copilot, Bing, Edge, the Gen AI team are all going to report to him. And I thought that was a really curious leadership choice. Like, does a star AI or, or superstar AI builder equate to someone that can lead a massive AI organization and an even larger organization? He's getting Sam Altman doll mm. job. I've got a Machiavellian thought. I don't know if it's valid or not, but you could say that this whole thing from a Machiavelli Game of Thrones point of view is Satya saying to Sam, I've got a backup, right? So in other words, there's has been this interesting power dynamic between Microsoft and Sam Altman and OpenAI. And we obviously, we talked a few months ago at length about the whole OpenAI Sam Altman board blow up. But I think it's fairly clear that OpenAI is both a massive asset to Microsoft, but also a concentration risk, right? Because Sam Altman has so much power. He's showed the power to the OpenAI board. He could probably also show that power in the other direction to Microsoft. So if Microsoft has a plan B, which is like, okay, Mustafa Suleiman is doing our AI stuff. So Sam, you have just lost a bit of leverage. I think that could be an interesting way of viewing what's going on here. I think this is on the face of it, what he's doing, right? He had single vendor, key man risk, and he wants to bring in a multi-model world, a multi-product world into Microsoft. He did a really smart move, which is to acquire in, or at least partner in the technology to get a head start, to bootstrap their AI efforts. And now he's building their own internal capacity his own internal models, his own internal, let's say, middleware layer so that you, they can lean on multiple models at the same time. So I don't think this is like a secret or it's even like a mind game with Sam Altman. I think it's an actual essential strategy is go fast with open AI and then build your own muscle and your own capacity internal so that you're not relying on any one model, any one person. Yeah, I mean, sounds like Suleiman, who I think was a deep mind guy, was he the, one of the original Google guys? Yeah. So who knows, Kimberly, if he has this sprawling organization that actually he manages that org, or it was designed to say, you're in charge of all this stuff just because we need AI infused in all these things. And like, you'd have a day-to-day -day COO type deal, but getting one of the best in the world to join Microsoft with a massive earnout plan and massive of authority and an Azure cloud use at will and license the thing. And I'm investing in Mistral, by the way, which is the European open AI and open AI. I mean, it seems like Satya cares about AI and he's not going to lose. And he is going to invest whatever it takes to make sure he's got every option and every capability at the table possible. So folks, if we zoom out on this, is AI really like lining up as Microsoft versus Google? Like this is back to the future stuff from the phone wars, right? We talked last week about Apple and Google kind of getting back into bed together, which is what it was like before the mobile days. Microsoft, like you said, Emil, they lost big on mobile. And I wonder if there's some institutional memory where Satya's like, this is the next thing. 
we're not going to be caught flat-footed. We're putting everything behind this. But if you look at most of the big players, they fall into one of the two camps, right? Google has the, the longest track record on this stuff. They have DeepMind, which is still absolutely a premier institution in AI. They suck at going to market. And now they're partnering with Apple, who might suck less. And in the meantime, Microsoft's hoovering up everything else. So is that really the battle of titans that we're seeing happening here? I would say that there is a possibility that that's true. We haven't heard what Apple's real strategy is yet, and they're important here. We don't know what Amazon's is. And Amazon legitimately has, although didn't have a plan mobile and has yet to go beyond e-commerce and cloud, the cloud thing is a huge asset in the AI world. The buying power, the servers, the data centers, the infrastructure piece is important. So I feel like there's other moves to be made. I think the question you raised, Yana, which I find really interesting, is like, can these independents, quote unquote, Anthropic, OpenAI, MidJourney, can they accumulate enough cash over time? Because this is going to be expensive mm -hmm. against Microsoft, Google, or Amazon and, and Apple. Like, is the deep pocket nature of these infinite cash companies ultimately going to be the death sentence for sort of the independents, quote unquote? Well, again, Microsoft's playing this very clever game of just either investing in or taking all the best staff from or partnering with all the independents. And at that point, they're not really independent anymore, are they? Like, I don't consider OpenAI to be an independent. So, you know, I think that's an interesting question. Amazon's a good point because you write about their cloud capability, but also in terms of product development, Amazon have always gone for the build for themselves first and then open it up as a platform. So who knows what they're doing, for example, in their data centers and so on. You could imagine Amazon's play being a bit more B2B, but once they've got the AI working really well for them, they'll probably open it up to everybody else. So they could be a dark horse in this. Well, as a side note, did you guys see that Mubadla just bought Sam Bankman Freed's holdings in Anthropic for like $900 million? Who is the acquirer? Mubadala, the sovereign wealth fund in Abu Dhabi. So Sam Bankman's Freed's creditors are going to get all their money back and more. <laughs> How unbelievable a twist of, not to mention Bitcoin prices, but like, wow. That's a good deal yeah. for Sam Bankman Freed. Well, not for, for him, for, for his, his creditors. creditors. <laughs> for his creditors. <laughs> but I don't know, guys, like, what's the lesson there? It's like diversification. It's like FTX had their money and all sorts of random stuff. And then one of the lottery tickets paid off and made everybody whole. It's hilarious. I don't know what the lesson is. I mean, theft never pays. Let's say that's because he's going to be in jail for decades. But it turns out this is one of these like quirky things where everyone's going to get their money back, thankfully. Yeah. Mm. At least it's a bit of a soft landing in the end there. Not for him, though. This episode of the Startup Podcast is brought to you by Vanta. The team at Vanta are passionate about helping you secure your business by vastly cutting down on the time to get compliant with frameworks like ISO 27001, SOC 2, and Essential 8. Vanta lets you close deals, sleep better at night, and get back to building your product. Help yourself and help the podcast by going to vanta.com slash TSP for an exclusive 20% off deal. All right. Our third topic is that Sequoia had their AI conference recently. Their second annual Sequoia Capital AI Ascent Conference, which is a gathering of a hundred top founders and researchers in AI. And there was a great post by Sonia Huang, a partner at Sequoia Capital, summarizing some of the discussions and key takeaways. There were a couple that stood out to me I thought worth discussing, worth unpacking here with the panel and maybe some of our founders who are listening, it can help adjust their thinking and the way they might be investing in their own AI apps. So the first idea that struck me from her post was that LLMs are increasingly becoming agents and agents is the name of the game. And agents as defined as choosing a sequence of actions, reasoning and planning and chaining these actions together. We've talked about this multiple times and it feels relatively straightforward and obvious to me that these LLMs want to become relatively autonomous, able to execute chains of commands, able to go away, do things for you and come back. Is this a revelation? Is there anything to unpack here further? I have one thought. I guess I'm known in, in this group, at least with Emil and Chris, as I guess not not bearish on LLMs. I'm, I'm very bullish on them, but thinking that they're still not having the impact that they could, that they are still in the uncanny valley and it's hard to use them, right, to fit them into your workflow. And part of that is, I think, the content they produce is high quality, but it's still somehow not human. And I think when you're doing a detailed task, when you're replying to an email, you know, you're doing co-pilot sort of stuff in Microsoft Office or Google Docs or trying to create copy, it's just not quite there. 
But you know what? Breaking down a task into its constituent parts is not a particularly creative task. Project management is actually a weakness of humans. And so I'm nearly wondering if we sort of flip it and say LLMs are probably closer to becoming effective agents that maybe <laughs> delegate the tasks to humans at certain points than the other way around. I would trust an LLM to come up with a good project plan and manage a team more than like, let's imagine we're doing creative like social media, right? I would rather have a stable of copywriters that the LLM tells what to do than a project manager who uses LLMs to create its content. Holy shit, that would be massively ironic, right? Like our predictions were that... Like rain on your wedding day. Right, like AI was <laughs> predicted to disrupt blue collar work first and the poetry and the creativity would never be disruptive because that was uniquely human. And now what you're saying is, no, we're not going to have AI workers. We're going to have AI managers, AI leaders, <laughs> and the work is going to be done by the human being. Well, it sounds like some Matrix Terminator 2 level shit that we're... <laughs> Kimberly, I saw you nodding along there a bit. What, what are your thoughts? I really enjoyed the reflection song that had from the Sequoia event. I think Chris is going to get to it, but particularly the implications for AI startups around building applications that will get better as the models get smarter. Yeah, the discussion at the event was that A, these models are going to get bigger, smarter, less expensive, and easier to use of course, and that the opportunity for startups is not to try to plug the holes or cover off the weaknesses of the models because the big boys are going to go do that. Much more importantly, much more interestingly, and much more opportunistically, the opportunity is to build apps on top of the models, bet that they're going to get better and put your app in a position where it gets better, smarter, cheaper as the model underneath gets better, smarter, cheaper. So that's what you're pointing to, Kimberly. I think that's a really smart idea. It's typical when new ecosystems are born, new platforms are created. Lots of enterprising entrepreneurs go and try to fill the gaps. And the gaps are the first things to get cannibalized and eroded by the platform. They're the most susceptible to platform risk. And so, yeah, building on top of the platform in niche places and in areas where that platform is less likely to go is, of course, the better, smarter, long-term bet. But I, I guess I didn't watch it. I didn't read about it. How is that not this wrapper? Like, what is the difference between an agent and a wrapper? Well, I think the difference between the model and the wrapper is that the model is relatively generalized. You know, Yanev and I always talk about this idea that free text chat-based interface lacks any kind of affordances. And so I think the opportunity for applications is to create workflows and UX affordances that make it easier for the user to understand and engage with and be productive with the underlying intelligence. Now, I think that falls over when you think about the AI potentially generating its own UX on the fly. And I think that's where this revolution might be somewhat different than the previous revolutions. How does an agent differ from a wrapper? I think that's relatively significant. I think the agent is more of a capability of the model, capability of the underlying system. You know, I think some wrappers are trying to turn LLMs into agents, but I, I think a lot of that capability will be down at the model level. I think this is more about, to use the old network layer stack, we're talking about saying if you're a startup, you should be innovating at the application layer. Yes. Right. And, and one way of thinking about it is every analogy is imperfect, but if you compare AI to the cloud, sure, there have been some rather large niche developer tool companies that have succeeded in the cloud, but in general, the way you respond as a startup to the rise of AWS going back 15 years is you build on top of it. You don't be like, oh, damn, I'm going to make AWS better. I'm going to compete with AWS. You're like, Look at all these incredibly powerful tools. This is a platform that gives me superpowers. How can I serve my industry sector, my customer needs, my choice of problem using this powerful new tool? Again, my feeling is that for the most part, not many people are really nailing that yet. I think it's actually, it's deceptively difficult to use because it sort of feels so simple. It's like, wow, AI does so much stuff for us. But as we've seen AI being incorporated into more and more applications, we see in general, it's not very imaginative and not as utile as you would hope. Like, I don't know, for folks who use Notion, like how often do you actually use Notion AI? I use it exactly never because it's a fun gimmick that actually doesn't help me with my workflows. And so I think that is the challenge. The challenge is here's this incredibly powerful tool. How can we exploit that tool? It is not straightforward, but whoever cracks it in their sector is going to be giving their users superpowers. And that's how you build a great startup. Yeah, I mean, it's the classic that we've been talking about for a little while now in the last episodes. Is right now what we're seeing is this surface level, like how fast can we add an AI button to our app? But these are not AI native applications. 
And so I think the next generation where these founders and product managers, engineers have had a chance to digest the ideas. I think we'll see a new kind of notion, a new kind of Canva, a new kind of Adobe Premiere, a new kind of office suite that is AI first. That is where you'll see real breakthrough innovation potentially. I don't know y'all, I'm still not seeing it. And the reason why is I can't imagine a workflow that a third party could put on top of some of these LLMs that is not easily copyable by any other company. So, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to provide this workflow for customer care, for fidelity, whatever. So I'm a specialist agent that is now like, I'm now helping you create this workflow so that you can do this for customer care. Like, how is that defensible? Well, I think it's a defensible the same way that it's defensible now, which is that you build all these specialist tools and workflows and network effects and business models and customer support and distribution. I think all of that still applies, Emil. The thing that I'm continuing to repeat and be concerned about is, is it defensible against the model itself generating the AI? That's what I mean. Oh, yes. You're saying defensible. Yes, yeah. I, I thought you meant defensible in terms of like I other mean, startups. I mean, I'm defensible against all of them. It, like you type in the workflow enough into the agent, the model learns what the agent does because the model sucks in the agent. So then you just go to the model. But I think that we're making a kind of category area here, right? Which is. There's LLMs and how can startups use it? And then there's this like the singularity approaches and it's end times. And you know what? It's like when the singularity comes, nothing that we talk about is relevant. It is like a different world and you can be more like techno optimist or techno pessimist or whatever, or you might think the singularity is a load of nonsense, but I don't think it's relevant to tactical discussions about how startups can exploit LLMs. Until the singularity comes, we're taking it one day at a time and trying to build a great business. Yeah, but I think there is a realm between here and the singularity that is much more pragmatic and near term. And I resonate with Emil really a lot about this, because if you're in a capital allocator, if you're a founder, if you're a product manager, and you're trying to think like, what can I build that is meaningfully useful and disruptive and long term viable. I agree with you, Emil. What I was responding to is how do the startups differentiate between each other? And assuming the yeah. model is not generating the UX, they're differentiating the way any business differentiates. But what we're now really both talking about is doesn't the model just generate the tool you need at runtime? And don't you basically just program it with natural language? Doesn't, you know, Joe's Timber products say, I want a CRM that does this, 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 and this. Oh, and by the way, when I do this, I want you to do this. And I want the interface to be pink and glossy. And I want it to support thousand agents in the field. And the AI goes, okay, here you go. Here's your bespoke CRM for Joe's Timber products. What's left for Salesforce to do in that world? That is a real question. That's not a singularity question. That's a question that's, that's question. Does Google and yeah. Microsoft, <laughs> yeah, does, that eat, does it eat the world, right? That's a freaking singularity. It's not singular. It's not like, do we have unlimited lifespans <laughs> and the rate of change is infinite and all this sort of singularity stuff. It's just saying software is fundamentally changed from being something that is hard to produce and hard to customize and hard to build and hard to distribute to. AI is eating software as software ate the world before it. And in that world, I'm not saying it's a slam dunk reality. I'm just saying in that world, ecosystems and startups and VCs become a lot less interesting and viable. And it's a non-zero mm. chance that we're moving into that world. Now, where I struggle is I can't imagine me saying, well, I want to build a social network where I can connect with my friends around this kind of object model and this kind of sharing model and this kind of community and moderation, because that needs to be a multiplayer shared experience. And someone somewhere needs to define that experience and define the social objects and the relationships and all that kind of stuff. So that that can't be a highly personalized, generated at runtime application. So I think social networks are a different category. But when you think about enterprise SaaS, when you think about personal, private, single player tools or tools amongst small communities of people and employees, I'm struggling to think, why do I need an opinionated, generalized, shared version of that when I could generate my own in a bespoke way? Kimberly, how do you view this from the investor lens? Again, you know, you, you see this cornucopia of AI startups, but who's going to be a winner? Well, I think for me, it seems like we're still in the very, still a lot of the deep tech going on. And as Chris mentioned, we're just now beginning to see the AI first applications being built. So even asking, oh, how is AI incorporated 
into your business model or how are you thinking about AI? Everyone's just making it up because they're still pretty early in how to incorporate it into their business models, if at all. Every pitch deck I see now, and I'm sure you see a lot more than me, are like, this is how we're incorporating AI. And for me, it's nearly not a red flag, but it makes me roll my eyes a little bit because it feels like here's this mandatory slide. It's sort of like your fake magic quadrant or whatever, where you're like, oh, we're going to use AI for this, but it's a bit fake, or at the very least, there's an element of wishful thinking there that's not a core part of the strategy. But have you seen startups that do better than that? Where, I mean, you use the phrase AI native in the sense that they have a product that they're building where it's not about building a foundation model, but it's more about they have a really intelligent take on how AI allows them to build a better product or to compete more effectively. I think of a startup that was doing some consumer thing came to me and said, our cost structure is going to be lower because we could use AI at a minimum to reduce our customer care costs. I'd be like, you're right. Thank God you're going to do that. You're not going to build this like sprawling <laughs> call center. Like there are some like practical things that all companies should be thinking about. AI better not the mandatory magic quadrant. There's some real money that can be saved like tomorrow on this stuff. The second thing I come back to all the time, and maybe it's like a bad example but like we use Expedia, TripAdvisor, Kayak, all these trip things. The apps they have in the AI app store right now are worse than just using OpenAI for travel stuff. Mm. They're worse. And I don't know why, but they're worse. So ultimately, I mean, I don't want to dwell on this question, Chris, you and I are obsessed with, because, but like, I'm just thinking like, how come my chat GPT why isn't that just going to be better than all these derivatives for things like that? Maybe like not everything, but for things like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I might be being reductive and simplistic about this, but it feels like we've had a million movies and narratives written about this and the way it plays out. Yes, there might be a lot of robots running around doing various tasks in the physical world, but when it comes to interacting with an AI in the cloud, it feels perfectly natural to me that you're going to have your own personal AI butler go do most of the work. And that butler, whether it's for you personally or for your company, is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting to generate bespoke applications or utilities or tools to make your life or your business easier and more productive. That's going to do a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of it. I think. And I don't think in the singularity future, I think in the next 10, 15 years, AI is going to eat software. And that's a meaningful problem for investors, for founders, for product managers, for engineers. That's going to reshape our industry the way that the industrial revolution reshaped the rest of the world, right? Let's talk about the last topic super quickly. It's related to this a little bit. The era of AI PCs, you know, talk about lipstick on a pig, talk about adding buttons to products and calling it AI. Apple announced the MacBook Air, the M3 MacBook Air, the best laptop for AI. And then Microsoft has just announced their AI PCs, the Surface line for pros and for business that are AI laptops. We don't want to spend too much time on this, but like, when does the marketing bullshit end? And when do we see real AI devices? More like the Rabbit R1. And if you guys haven't seen that, I would Google it. It's really cool. I think it's gimmicky, it's orange, it's got a weird shape, but I, I would love to see the Apple AI first mobile device or headphones or glasses. I think that's going to be a really compelling and exciting new era in hardware. Yeah. I mean, the Apple thing, like if I were to roll my eyes any harder, I'd be able to see what's behind me. <laughs> like, come on. Well, to the extent that having even, even faster neural engines, CPUs, GPUs, helps with anyone's day-to-day -day task on their laptops. I think that's awesome. You can never be too fast. I was like, gosh, my Microsoft Excel could be 35% faster on this new product. And I think that, you know, it's nice to have the newest hot is best toy. But importantly, this new MacBook Air is Apple's first to be made from 50% recycled content. So you're not only being faster, but you're also being better for the environment. I love it. Yeah, no, I mean, to be a serious a little bit about this, you know, I think mm. as more of these Gen AI models migrate to the client side, or rather there'll be more need for client side models to coexist with the larger cloud-based models. I think it makes more sense to call some of these devices AI ready devices. And so, yeah, as you said, Kimberly, the neural engines, the AI optimized co-processors start to make a little bit more sense. But I do think that for it to be AI native, you need to rethink the OS, you need to rethink the priorities of the hardware. A little bit more like the AI pin or the Rabbit R1, these things have been derided or dismissed. 
But I think it's a mistake, actually. I think Meta's glasses, for example, if we can cram enough client-side processing, battery power, and high-quality cameras that can run all day and tell you what's in front of you and why, I think that is a materially different user experience than people staring at their phone all day, walking around, tapping and playing with apps. What Apple said is meaningless. It's like, do you remember during peak crypto, there was this company, Long Island Ice Tea, it was publicly listed. They changed their name to Long Island Blockchain and their stock price tripled or something. It's like that. It's like, you know, this is the best iced tea for AI. Like, come on. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I saw, did you guys see this meme on Twitter or X that showed like Oral-B toothpaste box AI. and like with AI? <laughs> like, you know, even, you know, like buying a toothbrush now has AI capabilities. Like it learns my, how to brush your teeth. I don't know. But <laughs> cereal has AI. Like, you know. <laughs> All right. But yes, are there going to be at some point new ways that actually change the way we think about OSs? I think so. Mm. I mean, I, especially on the wearable side mm. where you're not, you don't have a mode of action with apps. Like you open your computer, you have browsers, apps and whatever. Changing the motion on that is going to take a while, I think. For wearables, where people don't have expectations, it might be e faster to have something that's AI native, so to speak. You know, I, I, mm. I actually think this makes the augmented reality world more accessible. Yeah. Historically, yeah. I think we've thought about augmented reality as a very complex waveguide display problem, like how we overlay all of this metadata with this very thin glasses. And I do think that AI changes the equation. I think the display becomes far less important and the overlay becomes far less important and it all becomes the incredible audio experience of an AI whispering into your ear and being able to see what you see mm. and to describe the feedback to you in your ear. And so I think all you've been herp Yeah, maybe. But I think augmented reality now becomes less about la layering pixels onto the world and more about the interpretation and action in the world while you walk around. It's a subtle but important difference. The display becomes less important. And so I'm imagining a world where we're not walking around looking at our phones anymore. We're just having a conversation with our agent. All right, is this a good place to wrap up, folks? It is. How can everybody find you guys on the internet? Emil, where can people find you? I'm on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Emil Michael. <laughs> I am Kimberly Marshall. I'm most easily found on LinkedIn, Kimberly N. Marshall, or on X at Kimberly Mar 12. And I'm on X, soon to once again be known as Twitter. I'm at Y Bernstein, but I do more of my stuff on LinkedIn where I'm easy to find. I am on the Elon Musk ego project known as Twitter and LinkedIn <laughs> and on my newsletter at chrisard.com slash newsletter. And don't forget, if you like listening to the Startup Podcast and get value out of it, implicitly you have signed up to the Startup Podcast Pack, which means you agree to follow us, leave us a written review on your favorite listening app, give us a shout out on LinkedIn, and subscribe to us on YouTube. Remember, every time you leave a written Apple Podcast review, a puppy is brought back to life. So it really helps us grow the show. Thanks so much for your support. All right, guys. Great to see you. As always, Kimberly, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, guys. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye. This episode of the Startup Podcast was brought to you by Vanta. Vanta helps businesses get and stay compliant by automating up to 90% of the work for the most in-demand compliance frameworks. With over 200 integrations, you can easily monitor and secure the tools your business relies on. Head to vanta.com slash TSP for 20% off their incredible offering and start unlocking extra revenue today.